Hi. Should we begin? Yeah, sure. Great. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Merchant Chamber of Commerce and Industry, I extend a very hearty welcome to all of you to the special e-session on economic resilience in uncertain times. Friends, since last year, India has been facing testing times. The restriction due to COVID pandemic disrupted domestic and global supply chains, which triggered a supply shock across the economy. The manufacturing sector endured a pervasive demand and supply shock penetrating almost all subsectors, including textiles, consumer goods, machinery, and equipment. A timely combination of monetary and fiscal policy last year to counter these negative impacts, along with a record agricultural production, helped India chart a V-shaped recovery. India's real GDP growth rate was projected to be the highest at 11.5% in the first quarter of the year 2021. There are five lead macroeconomic indicators reflecting a country's economic performance that include real GDP growth rate, merchandise exports growth rate, current account balance as a percentage of GDP, general government net spending uh, as a percentage of GDP, and gross debt to GDP. On the basis of five indicators, India emerged as the most resilient economy after Germany in the first period of 2021. However, since April, India witnessed a more acute COVID-19 second wave. The different states of the country had to impose restrictive measures to break the chain. These restrictive measures again interrupted the economic activity, leading to stalling of the recovery process and accentuating the risks. There are apprehensions that the second wave may be followed, may not be followed with a V-shaped recovery as last year. There are several concerns that underlie this understanding. Number one, the extent of human tragedy and its impact on our labor force. Number two, the probable loss of consumer confidence and hereby curtailed uh, effective demand. Number three, major supply side breakdown uh, of, uh, due to prolonged restrictions and its possible impact. And the last high inflation rate coupled with rising prices of raw material and fuels. To enlighten us more, we have today none other than Sri Sanjeev Sanyal, Principal Economic Advisor, Government of India. Sri Sanyal also serves as the co-chair of the Framework Working Group of the G20. Sri Sanyal was earlier the Managing Director and Global Strategist at Deutsche Bank and has studied at Sriram College of Commerce, Delhi, and also is a Rhodes Scholar of St. John's College. It will, uh, you know, it will be uh, amazing if I don't mention that he's also a Zavarian. With this, I request Sri Sanyal to enlighten us and help us understand how, uh, you know, what we could expect in the coming few months. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a pleasure to speak to all of you uh, in back in my, most of you are not all exclusively, but a sizable proportion of you are from my hometown, Kolkata. So, um, well, the obviously the topic of today is about how policymakers make policy in circumstances of high uncertainty. And obviously we are passing through one for the last uh, 15 odd months. So uh, I will use that as the backdrop to give you a sense of how we think about issues. What are, what are the practical uh, uh, decision points that we face with it will give you, it is not very diff different very often from what you uh, businessmen feel, face as well, which is uh, how do you respond to uh, circumstances where the dynamics, which is highly dynamic environment. And it will also give you a sense of why we took whatever decisions we did at various times, uh, which is a combination obviously of responding to new information for hedging uh, out the, uh, uh, you know, the, the worst case scenarios, uh, because you don't know what exactly will happen. And how do you respond as information becomes better? How do you try to uh, take uh, advantage of various options that you have, the tools that you have, and also, of course, some view of how to think about what are the various different directions in which things can pan out. Now, I'm making this uh, 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 point right up front because very often, um, uh, for some reason, um, a lot of the policy debate uh, takes place as if we are functioning in an environment where improved planning would have led to better outcomes. This is actually a complete misnomer. 
and is probably a, some leftover from our old socialist era of five year plans there is no amount of better planning or five year 10 year 20 year planning which would have told you that in 2020 you were going to face this pandemic even if you know that periodically you do face global epidemics it's very difficult to tell exactly how when and uh, uh, they will occur what their scale will be and what the response will be so given that environment how do you respond so i'll take you through the sequence of events and you will see how to think about it if you went back for example to last march what is the information i as a policy maker or you uh, as a citizen had we basically knew that something really bad had happened in china that it had spread to uh, italy and that it was killing a lot of people we really didn't know how things spread we had no idea how uh, to treat it or even test for it because testing was still unknown uh, 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 kits had not been created yet so we were basically at that stage totally guessing so like many other governments around the world we called in the experts you know everybody says that you should have a scientific approach to this so we called in the experts like every government did the problem is that all the top experts came and gave us very different prognosis and you will remember there were those who made the case that this was nothing much more than a very bad flu and then there were those who said this was going to kill millions of people and everything in between now every other government must have also uh, been given this this series of prognoses so i as a decision maker how do you take a decision when you get such a wide range of outcomes possible outcomes well one possibility is that you choose the one you think that is the most likely and you respond down that path so this is the thinking fair for example for the swedish model they decided like look this is the likeliest path and you choose that that was also what the uk initially did they went, were talking about going for herd immunity and many other countries uh, you know the problem with this for india is that with 1.35 billion people once we have gone down a certain path and we have chosen a certain path you can't really change direction so you can't do what singapore does which is opted for one model and then opted for another one so we knew right up front one thing first of all we knew that whatever path we decided to take we had to stick with it two we also knew that um that rather than choosing a certain path it may be better to simply assume that we did not know anything about how this thing uh, was going to pan out i e we were dealing with complete uncertainty now how do you deal how do you make policy complete uncertainty well there is there are various ways but the option we opted for is something called a barbell strategy those of you from a financial background will know what a barbell strategy is basically in a barbell strategy what you do is you do uh, combine two opposite approaches so you hedge for the very worst possible outcomes and then you use a bayesian updating of information to make your way forward so this is basically what we did we locked down completely why did we lock down completely because when you have absolutely no idea what's going to happen but there is a possibility that this could be really bad and kill a lot of people well you lock down completely you're hedging for the worst this is not because you think it will be the worst you're just hedging for the worst this also buys you time to gather information build out some quarantining capability build out some things like ppe kits testing and all and of course remember time is passing so other countries are also getting uh, affected and consequently this gives us a better sense of what we can do to reduce the um uh, uh, the impact so uh, just imagine if we had had something equivalent to the second uh, the, the spike of the second round had happened in the first round then what would have happened so this is what we were doing this is not because we did not recognize the economic costs of it obviously it doesn't require a genius to know if you shut down the system it pains the economy but you had to do it because you had to lock it down for the worst case now as information became more and more available you then begin to open things up step by step this is a feedback loop system you basically get more information 
you update your response you, through a Bayesian approach and you move forward. So using that, we move forward and by September, October, as the, the, the number of cases uh, peaked, we actually opened things up. Now people will ask, oh, why are you opening things up when cases are actually going up? Well, the reason is if you have better information, you can open things up because you'd have, you, have to, you have to hedge less for the very worst case because by, by September, even though cases were spiking, we knew that, uh, well, there are certain parts of the population it doesn't affect as much as other parts. So we had some sense of the demographics that it impacts. We had some sense of how to test for this. We had some sense of, um, uh, of how to treat it. So even though in September cases were going up, we were more confident in September than we were in March and therefore we're willing to open things up. Now, exactly the same approach was taken on the economy. Many people said, you know, why aren't you going out there and doing what many other governments were doing as your trillion dollar packages, opening them up, you know, try to reinflate demand. Our point right from the beginning was that this was not a demand problem. The problem was a supply side problem, i.e. we had shut things down. So there is no point in pressing the accelerator when you've got your foot on the brake. So therefore we did not do very initially begin to spend on reinflating the economy. Instead, again, we did, a buy, we did the same barbell strategy, i.e. expend energy on cushioning for the worst. So you see the kinds of things we spent on in the period March to September, 2020, this was mostly about cushioning. This is the con uh, context in which we provided, um, you know, the world's largest food program, 800 million people provided with food. We transferred some small amount of money to the very poorest. This is not, people say, oh, what, you know, that will not going to reinflate the economy. Well, actually, it's not meant to reinflate the economy. It's meant to provide a safety net. Similar thing for MSME sector. You created these this three lakh crores worth of uh, guaranteed loans for MSMEs. You pushed back all the financial um, um, uh, deadlines. None of which it, you, nobody is making the case, including us, that that is going to reinflate the economy. What you're doing is providing a safety net. Now, come. October, we had opened up enough of the economy and a lot of pent up demand, of course, came back, which many of you would have seen, but that is also when we began to ramp up government spending. So it's only in October that we began to ramp up spending and there we spent, began to ramp it up in a peculiar way, which is by spend on capital expenditure. Two reasons why we did. One is capital expenditure is the fastest way to make sure that demand gets reinflated. Secondly, we knew and were very conscious that we were running up debts while doing this. So it's important to build up assets for running up those debts. Your businessman, you'll understand exactly what I mean. So you saw the economy get accelerate quite sharply. And um, by the quarter of January to, um, uh, to March, the economy had recovered very strongly. Well, you know, it was a V-shaped recovery. You clearly saw a lot of things going back. In fact, many numbers were above what they were before COVID. So we had clearly recovered. We were seeing positive GDP growth rates year on year without the base effect. Obviously the base effect will this happen today's quarter, but that was before really the base effect. So you are going to, you were seeing real actual growth. That is the context in which, by the way, we presented a budget, which was by and large universally appreciated, which was an aggressive uh, reform oriented budget aiming towards further supporting a recovery. So that is the, the context in which that budget was presented. Now, come end of March, you began to see um, some glimmerings in, I think, the, particularly in the, in the uh, state of Maharashtra, a second wave tend to come in and then in April, May, you got the two, you got the full brunt of the second wave come through. Now that obviously, did, um, you know, uh, caused a disruption. No question that uh, there were many kinds of disruptions that happened as a result of it. One was obviously, again, lockdowns came through. You didn't have a national lockdown, but you did have state level lockdowns and some of them were quite serious. Uh, two, there was obviously a um, big uh, 
psychological impact which comes through from uh, the health consequences of a very sharp spike in both um, uh, uh, infection rates and then a little bit later in also in uh, deaths, which, which were somewhat uh, significantly higher than what had happened in the first round. Now, <clears throat> you may argue that uh, you know, we should have done a national lockdown, but let me say that there is a great difficulty in doing a national lockdown. Um, the health care delivery, for the most part, is more efficiently done by the states because that is how we are set up constitutionally. Health is basically a state subject. Most of the health capacity is done by the states. The center can do certain things, but doing a national lockdown is a very blunt thing to do. It's a, extremely costly economically. And while there are certain things like, as we discovered, vaccination that should probably be best done centrally, the actually on the ground delivery has, even in vaccination, the procurement can be done by the center, but ultimately delivery and the delivery on the ground is still done, being done very large extent by the states. So the states have to be really the, the, it has to be a decentralized system by the states rather than trying to do this lockdown, except for some things that you can't but do in a national way. As I said, procurement of vaccines may be one example, but otherwise it's a blunt tool. So we did not do a national lockdown as the prime minister as well pointed out. We did, however, do state level lockdowns, city level lockdowns. And now, as you know, we are now coming off that uh, uh, second wave. Uh, I'm not a health expert uh, and I don't pretend to know exactly when a third wave may or may not come. But let me say that the same principles uh, are there, which is that <clears throat> there can, uh, we have to accept that we are dealing with uncertainty. So while I keep seeing, uh, you know, uh, experts who keep plotting these nice Gaussian graphs saying that this is how the third wave will come, etc. Well, it is a possibility, just like the second wave was a possibility. And it may well happen. And it depends on many things, including how citizens um, uh, take precautions. So we need to, we need to take uh, some uh, 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 steps to, uh, against this third wave. But I don't think you can meaningfully, as a policymaker, say that this wave will be exactly like this. It'll take off on this date. This is how it'll pan out. It's far better to do a Bayesian updating of information by doing better surveillance. So the point I'm making is surveillance and continued testing even after the, the, uh, this has subsided is a very important, it is more important than our ability to forecast how things will pan out. This is important, not just from the health perspective. And I keep coming back to this point. When you're dealing with high uncertainty, it is important to stress and acknowledge the uncertainty rather than have what Frederick Hayek used to say, have a pretense of knowledge. So surveillance and situational awareness is more important than some false forecasting tool or model. What you therefore need is better surveillance. And this is also true for the economy. We need to watch very carefully what the data is saying rather than to prejudge exactly how the economy will behave from here on. And of course, so here coming back to the economy, there are many directions in which the economy can revive or not. For, the, for simplicity, let me provide three likely ways in which it could pan out. There are other ways as well, but there are three scenarios that are possible, which are probable. One possibility is that we remove all the uh, <clears throat> uh, restrictions, the lockdowns, uh, just like with the first round, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, you know, some pent up demand, it comes back and uh, maybe some currently exports, et cetera, are, are doing well, you get this bump up in economic activity, but then it does not sustain uh, there are many reasons this may happen. Uh, one could be that uh, you know consumers uh, have 
taken a big uh, uh, psychological hit from this uh, COVID crisis and so are not willing to go out back out there and spend the way they did after the first round. So in that situation, you'll get a bit of a bump up and then it kind of slows down again. Now, in, under those circumstances, obviously, the uh, government will have to, uh, you know, make sure that we have to put in the effort and uh, maybe provide some more support. And we will do what is necessary, both from the monetary and the fiscal front. There is another possibility. And that possibility is that, in fact, the economy comes roaring back like it did in the first round. Um, it, uh, there are many reasons this could happen. Uh, pent up demand is, of course, one. But remember, um, we are uh, continuous. Uh, we did do a large number of uh, demand enhancing measures and put them in the pipeline, including infrastructure spending, which continued, by the way, through the, uh, through the second wave. Uh, that didn't get shut down. There are many parts of the economy that were not as affected as in the first round. So there is continuous uh, momentum in there. Uh, exports are doing very well. Many of you will know that your order books are in good shape if you're exporters. Um, there are certain sectors like construction and infrastructure where order books are also very strong. Uh, agriculture also seems to be doing well. Uh, many non-contact services continue to be strong. And as you open up even the contact contact related services comes back. So in that case, we see this very strong revival, but it comes with inflation. So now under those circumstances, we have to have a very different approach than if demand popped up and then slowed down. Because in the second scenario, you will uh, be, you know, one problem will be less of a concern, which is growth, but the second concern uh, of inflation will be there. You obviously have international oil prices, but other commodity prices also heightened. Uh, you, you know that this is an international problem already. Uh, you've had record inflation in the US as well and many other countries. Part of it is, of course, there is a, um, some year-on-year -year impact of uh, base effects, but fact of the matter is, you know, this, we have had very easy monetary policy, fiscal policy around the world so a possibility of inflation coming back after many, many years has to be also watched. So this is a second scenario. And in that scenario, we will have to be very careful that while we continue doing all the uh, good things that we said in the budget and we continue to support uh, demand, we need to be very careful of the secondary impact on inflation. So, there, so the, the balance of uh, risk uh, begins to change from growth, which is not so much a problem in this scenario, but inflation becomes the issue. Then there is a third scenario that the, but some part of the economy does revive very strongly. And you do have this inflation uh, situation, but then there are certain parts of the economy that don't revive. So here you have a differentiated uh, recovery. Some parts of the economy become red hot and it becomes, you know, uh, inflationary, but then there are other parts of the economy that don't recover. I mean, could be, there are certain sectors, for example, like <clears throat> tourism, restaurants, etc., that have been particularly hit a second time. Uh, you know, they have went through two rounds of being shut down almost entirely. And let's say if consumer demand doesn't come back uh, strongly, then, you know, they are really in, in, in a great deal of difficulty. Under those circumstances, then we have to be, uh, you know, you you can't provide general support because that's what we, that would have been the response in scenario one, but in scenario three, if you provide general support, that problem is that, you know, those parts of the economy that are red hot will become even, even hotter and generate inflation. And a lot of the effort you're putting in getting dispersed. So here you have to do a much more targeted response where the generalized response is much more like scenario two, but in addition, you have to do something which is much more targeted to those industries that are not recovering fast enough. So given that that is the range, there are other scenarios. I just gave you three probable scenarios. But the main point being made here is that rather than rushing and say, oh, this is what we should do. And you know, let's announce a whole bunch of new measures because you know, it would make good copy you will agree that it is more sensible to, 
to, to watch what actually happens and then respond to it quickly. Again, very similar to, to what we did in the health front that you watch and respond quickly to what actually happens rather than forecast what happens and try and do it. Now, of course, while doing this, you still have to hedge for the worst. And therefore, while you're hedging for the worst, we have put in place, again, for an extended period, uh, the world's largest free food program. We have extended out various, um, for MSMEs, various schemes. Um, we are continuing to do, throughout this entire cycle, lots and lots of supply side measures, which may keep being a surprise. Why are you doing supply side measures? Well, you're doing supply side measures because you need to keep opening up uh, new avenues for a uh, private sector to go in there and invest. Otherwise, how will um, sort of uh, the, the, the animal spirits of the private sector come back? So you have to keep doing opening things up, uh, easing up. We had already, of course, done they eased up the tax burdens even before the crisis back in 2019. But there are other things you can do. Yesterday, for example, we further liberalized the IT BPO sector um, and all the norm, telecom related norms relating to IT, IT BPO sector. So some of you, maybe from the IT BPO sector, will know exactly what I mean. Um, a month back, we had opened up, of course, uh, the geospatial and cartography sector. And there are other sectors where we are also uh, opening things up, like the drones sector is being opened up and so on. So you keep opening up new areas uh, for uh, new investment. And meanwhile, of course, uh, try and participate in global supply chains. That's where the PLI schemes came in because, and they, they have been very successful. And we continue to see record foreign direct investment flows, particularly into IT related uh, sectors. And so very large investments are coming in. In the last one year, I think some I don't remember the number exactly, but it's something in the, in the range of $64 billion of FDI has flowed in. So it's, it's a lot of FDI uh, and so on. Now, there is, the, of course, the issue is, can the financial sector support such a, a revival in growth? And here, there is a somewhat differentiation we need to make between the capital markets and the banking system. The capital markets have actually uh, seem to be quite exuberant. Um, stock markets are at record highs, as you know, uh, and there is lots of capital in there, at least for now. Uh, there is also private equity and other non-market routes, but they're, um, you know, they're also part of the, the uh, equity route of financing expansion. So that sort of channel of capital seems to be doing well. The other channel of uh, 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 capital flow, however, continues to be quite risk averse, which is the banking channel. And um, credit growth continues to be uh, quite muted. Um, now, one could ask, one, the obvious question to ask is, what is the condition of the banking system uh, given the shock we went through? And um, my answer is that we will know for sure only once we begin to, you know, right now, a lot of things have been put in abeyance from the IBC in particular. So in that sense, the information flow is not as clear, but so I'm going to say what I think is in my judgment, what has happened. I think when you go back to normal circumstances, there will be some, perhaps some bump up in um, NPS popping up as a result of this, uh, you know, one and a half years of COVID. But I think the shock will be smaller than people fear. And the reason for that is that even coming into this crisis, um, the banking system and the financial system generally was not very highly leveraged. So back in 2018, 2019, uh, we went through a huge cleanup of the banking system. And it was quite painful at that time. But what it did do, it meant that we went into this crisis with a banking system that was not leveraged. Um, in many ways, it was much more cash rich than would normally be the case. So even though we have gone through, uh, I think, 18 months of difficulty from the COVID related disruptions, I think our Indian banking system will come out of this much better than people fear. So some hit will be there. There will be companies that have obviously been hit. There will be some need for restructuring here and there. But I don't think the wholesale 
um, sort of credit destruction that people very often feared uh, is going to happen. Far from it, uh, the NCLT system has continued to work. Uh, you will see that even through this last one and a half years, major companies have got sold off. Uh, as we speak, I think DHFL, for example, is getting done. Uh, Jet is coming back on stream. So many of the uh, IBC process related um, cases are still getting sorted. The machinery is still working. Um, so while when we go back to normally beginning to uh, recognize bad debts, some of those may come back into, into the pipeline. I think the pipeline itself is functioning. The NCLT pipeline is still functioning and has cleared up some space along the way. So my guess is that um, I think the Indian banking system, although it is currently not aggressively expanding, it will also not be very badly hurt and at some future date will be able to get back and uh, expand when the sort of animal spirits come back. So with that, let me stop and open it up for questions. Uh, great. Uh, Sri Sanya, thank you so much. I think uh, what you've done is uh, you've actually presented in a manner that's allowed us to look at it very objectively. And I, for one, had come in with some set of questions. Now, I find some of them irrelevant because you've made me realize during your conversation that, you know, that's not the right approach. But um, before I uh, request uh, some of our uh, members, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to ask you the first question. Um, you know, there is a very, very common thought, uh, which is there amongst many people I know, and especially amongst the micro and small medium uh, business owners, that this particular uh, episode of uh, the lockdown and, you know, subsequent lockdowns that might come in the future will make it extremely difficult for them to survive. And, uh, you know, the whole system is working in a way which would make it less and less viable for smaller uh, business entities to uh, function profitably. So your thoughts on that, you know, because, uh, you know, some expert view or uh, outlook on that would be really appreciated. So obviously, the, the, now, this is very difficult to generalize. There are certain sectors that are doing still very well. So it's not true, but yes, there will be sectors even big companies will have difficulty. For example, hospitality. It doesn't matter if you're big or small. I mean, it's shut down, it's shut down. But yes, for MSMEs in particular, credit becomes a particular issue. And if the pipeline of activity keeps being switched on and off, um, this is difficult. I mean, we all recognize that. Um, so in that context, what do we do? Now, the first thing to be done is to try and minimize this switch on, switch off problem. Uh, and for that, um, sadly, uh, one is of course COVID appropriate behavior, masks and all that, but ultimately what matters is going to be to get the vaccination out there. There is no other thing we can do. I mean, if you have any other plans, please let us know. But frankly, you know, this is not a problem of our creation and uh, it's still a problem that mutates so it does seem, however, that vaccines do seem to work. Um, uh, and our own vaccines has reasonably good efficacy. So in that context, I think getting the vaccination process out there, and, and I think we have begun to get that uh, problem, that, that, that is the most important thing we need to do is that the switch on, switch off problem is stop solved. Because Nothing else will matter if, if we keep going into lockdowns and out of it all the time. Particularly, we certainly don't want to use a blunt tool like a national lockdown, if we can afford not to do it. So, sure. so I, I would argue, and hence this huge effort, as you can see, in ramping up vaccination. And in the last few days, you would have seen a palpable spike up in vaccination. We need to get that out there and keep doing it, particularly for the 18 plus, those for below 18, you know, that age group doesn't seem to be so badly affected, but certainly for those above 18 to get it up there and make sure that, you know, uh, particularly in uh, high spreading areas like, you know, large cities and uh, or any anywhere that has large transportation networks. So, you know, anything that can lead to uh, a sudden uh, uh, super spread event make sure that those, those places are completely covered. This is, and of course, eventually 
uh, as much of the population as possible. So I think vaccination is absolutely critical. Um, second important thing is that um, you know credit gets to the gets wherever we can get it. Um, so <clears throat> obviously there are issues here. Uh, because very often the informal sector does not, it's very difficult to get credit output, as you know. So many models have been tried using uh, GST and other information to provide credit. But in the end, getting the overall economy running again has got to be the best thing we got to do. So that is why I keep coming back. The health thing has got to be sorted, then everything else. Uh, can I request the moderator to bring in uh, Rajesh Nath uh, to ask the next question? Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Sanyal. Thank you for the overview, the broad overview you presented. Uh, Mr. Sanyal, I head the German Engineering Federation here in India. Uh, my question to you is regarding the PLI scheme, Mr. Sanyal. Of course, the government is quite upbeat about the PLI scheme. Now, the whole concept of the PLI scheme is based on incremental growth, uh, Mr. Sanya, because the incentives are supposed to be uh, given on the incremental growth. But now with the second wave hitting us, where will this incremental growth come from? And uh, if the second part I wanted to add also is the raw materials flow, because we are seeing huge supply chain disruptions, automotive industry uh, has been impacted. So with the supply chain disruptions also, would it not impact also the manufacturing who are looking to benefit from the PLI scheme? So I think uh, that is the wrong way to think about it. The PLI scheme is not a short to medium term response to uh, COVID. That should be absolutely clear to you. It is an attempt to create, insert India into global supply chains right. and to build scale. So irrespective of current disruptions, this is not the right thing to uh, discuss in the context of you know covid related uh, obviously covid has created uh, more uh, what should i say awareness of um, supply chains resilience and and so on but uh, this is uh, the pli schemes main thrust is to build up over the next 5 years or so uh, large capacities in certain areas. So PLI scheme cannot deal with, you know, spike in co commodity prices or other, other disruptions in the supply chain, uh, unable to get chips or whatever for uh, your cars. Uh, if, if you know, the PLI scheme would, uh, the, the world view of PLI schemes is the idea is to get those chips manufactured in India. Uh, the supply chain itself can't be dealt with with the PLI scheme. The PLI scheme is not meant for that. That has to be dealt administratively on the ground. Whatever disruptions are happening have to be eased the hard way, which is by easing up the supply chain as it exists today. Uh, right. Can you. I request Mr. Prajananda Chaudhary to ask the next question? Uh, am I audible? Yes, please. Please go ahead. Uh, I mean, Bangladesh uh, Prashno Kuchi, Shanjib Babu. Apni Matro stock market capital power bapare, one of the sources is a stock market recotta Ule Kolin. Amar Prashno Huche, J. Amraki, a stock market repore depend Kotnepari, Jeta Boom Kotse without any improvement of the, uh, the fundamentals. That is the uh, economic growth. <laughs> GDP growth balloon, inflation situation balloon, whatever, nothing is encouraging. But stock market daily record the high growth. So many uh, experts, even uh, recently, uh, RBI also the experts is concerned that there are bubbles. So, Amraki, Aidhorone stock market report depend as a source of getting capital. Uh, I mean, English they bolbo can make it. So the question is that, is the stock market a dependable source of capital because there may be a bubble there, right? That is the question asked. So my uh, question is, firstly, let me say that I never comment on the exact level of the stock market for obvious reasons. Um, 
yes. it would not be right for me to comment on the level of the stock market except to say that there is clearly capital flowing into it and th uh, you know those trying attempting to raise money through it for the, that limited purpose i.e the primary market um, this is certainly a good time to do it uh, because good valuations are available now if and when uh, if you are making the argument that there may be a circumstance in future where it may not be so good well we will you know those circumstances will have its own logic um, right now it appears to be that this it is a, a period where good valuations are uh, are available large amounts of resources are indeed getting uh, picked up from this uh, uh, from this uh, capital market um, and many companies are attempting to list themselves uh, at this point in time now if you are saying that in some future date this may not be a good time yes capital markets do go up and down that's that's known but in, you know the other sources of capital can kick in the banks may begin lending so my view is that that is not a that is not a, that is not the meaningful way of thinking about uh, capital markets capital markets go up and down and that it's it's a part of the animal spirits of the private sector uh, now i request uh, mr vikas kandoi to ask his question good evening mr sanyal uh yes what i can mr kandoi uh, please continue yeah, yeah. so uh, we are exporters uh, based out of eastern part of india and uh, one of the troubles we've been facing over the last 3 4 months is the availability of containers now is this something which the is a short term or is china related or is this something which is uh, part of the strategy for long term solution being looked at by the government well i am i know about the issue but i am not an expert on what exactly is driving it i have heard many theories including the fact that you know once our own imports pick up the the flow through will improve but i i am not the right person to be to be commenting on this somebody from the commerce ministry may be better uh, okay. able to tell you what is exactly happening so i also know about this the way you know about it and maybe you know more about it <laughs> i do know that this is an issue yes and has been now for 6 months at least um and there was initially some part of it was just that our own lockdown had caused our own imports to shrink so yes. consequently the, the the inflow of uh, of uh, containers had uh, had sort of stopped but that has uh, that part of it i think should have normalized as our economy has opened up yes okay. so i have one more question if you may permit yeah so uh, discretionary services of uh, micro nature for example we we used to run a gymnastics program for children i'm just giving a very random example for you but which employed 10 people or 12 people they have had to shut down over a period you know last year and this massive unemployment i would assume because of that so as an entrepreneur i did not have an option but to shut it down so what 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 solutions do you think i know everything cannot be addressed but do you think there are solutions for these issues for people those who well, are employed we have provided obviously this uh, some degree of cushioning using things like for example the guaranteed uh, loans for msmes which we had done now we recognize that there may be many companies where this may not be able to uh, resolve this issue and as i said ultimately the best solution is that the um the economy is opened up and these activities resume uh, you can provide all kinds of palliatives but in the end they are all palliatives the, the ultimate solution is those activities have to come back and i mean i know of a case like this i don't know vitika banerji runs it uh, a, a gymnastics program like yours maybe it's the same one you're talking about and uh, <clears throat> so the issue there is a very simple one and you know the the only way that you can have a sustained revival of all these activities is that those activities go back to doing what they were doing right thank you sir so that is the reason this vaccination roll out has to be done unless we do that all the other things are just holding operations that's the best we can do so hence the focus on getting this vaccination out there 
open the system out because those activities have to come back out. I mean, you can think of complicated ways of getting subsidies out there, but you know, how long can you keep that going and how, by the time we get the machinery out there to, to pump it out to you, this is problem will disappear. So, so it is better to try and focus on getting the system open up and, and let the cash flow flow through the system as soon as possible. That's, that's the best bet. Uh, so for the next question, uh, can I request Mr. Abhishek Law? So we'll have to uh, keep track of the time, yeah? So Sure. So can we just have one more question after this? Why don't you ask both the questions and then I'll answer them together. Sure. Mr. Uh, Abhishek, uh, quickly, please ask a question. We are running short of time. You need to um, unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Mr. Sanal, this is Abhishek from Business Line Newspaper. I just need to know, you spoke about supply side measures and we have seen them act out during between the bridge period between wave one and two. Are demand side measures expected anytime soon, primarily because there are issues like inflation, still concern about consumer spending in some, cap, in some service sectors or some uh, expenditure related issues here. So do we see any demand measures coming from the government side? So remember that we have already got many demand side measures in place. Mm -hmm. um, people forget that we announced a, a full budget, which was quite expansionary back in February. Mm -hmm. And that uh, implementation of that budget is over, you know, all the way through to next March. And obviously there were some disruptions in April, May. Now we have to be, we are back on track on that. And we have to implement that budget, which as I, as I said, that has, um, that was clearly a expansionary budget. So first of all, our existing sort of uh, track is already one of expansion, right? Now the question is, do we need to press the accelerator harder or softer beyond that what we were planning to do? Now, obviously that depends very crucially on what actually happens going forward. And that is the why I gave you, I don't know if you, when you came in, but I laid out three uh, possible paths we could go down. And I just said that, look, we already have a expansionary tilt, both on the fiscal and on the monetary side. Mm. If necessary, we will do more. But of course, we have to take into account other possibilities, including the fact that the growth may be much stronger than people realize and inflation becomes the issue. Now, now nobody can predict exactly which of these paths we will go down. We could also have one where economy comes back and inflation becomes an issue, but there are some sectors like the previous uh, person was mentioning where the economy booms, inflation is there, but some sectors don't revive. So in that situation, we have a third situation where we, we have to be careful of over, over pumping demand, but on the other hand, we have to provide a targeted support to those bits of the economy that are not reviving despite the overall recovery. So, our response is contingent partly on how exactly things pan out. So rather than, um, you know, try to exactly forecast where things will be, it is better to do better surveillance and closely watch high frequency data in the next six weeks to see which of these paths is the likely path. And of course, remember, this is also contingent on global developments on inflation and demand. So all of them, I think, as we get a better sense of where in the next six weeks, which path we are going down, we will know what extra things we need to do. But our default continues to be what we had done in February. Uh, for the final question, I'll request Mr. Nirmal Saraf uh, to quickly ask his question. I just want to make an observation. Uh, we talked about the shortage of containers, et cetera. I think uh, what is happening is total supply chain disruption, which has happened across the supply chains. And we are seeing this now in the country also. So of course, uh, I agree with you when you said that the response to the pandemic has to be decentralized with the, say, vaccine procurement is done by central government and the rollout being by state government. But with the, you see, there's no uh, matching in the lockdowns being uh, imposed in different states. And because of that, there's huge supply disruptions. One state is in lockdown. We are going to get uh, input from that state or maybe a customer is in that state. Uh, logistics is totally disrupted. We are seeing the similar thing happening worldwide. 
with it's not only containers not coming into india there's a huge shortage of containers around the world there's a logjam in china and so these disruptions how do you plan to take care of these disruptions i think they are more fundamental to getting the economy back on uh, rail uh, compared to uh, cash flow sector which can be managed which the government is managing well in my uh, so the matching of this is trickier done through a centralized system even inside the country because for example the lockdowns that are happening are happening in response to a external shock which is health situation yes. right so i have no way centrally to decide that the lockdown in place x uh, matches or unmatches a lockdown in a place y because they are not being driven by economic uh, requirements but by a completely different logic which is the waves uh, as it passes through the system so it may be the case that your production unit in maharashtra he is being severely affected by you know one input that comes from somewhere in uh, telangana but and that telangana place gets shut down because there is a spike but now you you see i can th there is no centralized way of matching this because there is no centralized way of predicting where it will happen and that's why i keep coming back to you with this point please do not have this mental idea that this can be this problem can be solved with better planning this is not a planning problem and i'm making this point over and over again because so much of our media our policy making time our public discourse is taken up by a largely useless debate on better planning right because so, yeah. the situation is contingent on an unpredictable item now there are things you can plan better for example vaccination procurement right that yes. can be planned better yes but this problem you pointed out cannot be planned better it can only be responded to fast so so you have to think on your feet yes. you have to think on your feet okay. so don't try to solve the wrong problem with the wrong tool you see you know i keep seeing some iit keeps print, you know printing out these nice gaussian graphs of how the next wave will come with five different nice curves of how it will be actually there are five different curves with five different possible uh, 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 responses from me what's the point they are nice mathematical curves but there's nothing as a policy maker i can do with them you see so that's the point i'm making so that is a waste of time what i do need to do if we are truly concerned about the next wave is to continue with a reasonable clip of testing irrespective of whether cases have gone down so just because cases have come down we should still maintain a fairly high level of testing so what happens is that we have better surveillance so as and when things begin to deteriorate we have a very good idea where it's going to happen and we respond similarly we now know having gone through two cycles that should there be a spike in about 3 weeks from that point we will require oxygen and beds right we know that so that we can plan for but we can't plan for when that spike will happen it so is be very clear you're a businessman you know what i'm saying there are certain things you plan for certain plan things you should not plan for but plan for and hedge for the worst outcome so uh, by the way a lot of what i'm talking about comes from something called complexity theory i've given a lot of talks about it Com so complex systems thinking is all about flexible response as opposed to you know prescriptive planning great so uh, thank you uh, thank you uh, shishanya really appreciate this uh, you know time you've given although there are a couple of more raised hands but i will not insist on you answering them uh, because uh, you know we have a schedule to keep so with that i would request mr rishab kothari a senior vice president to uh, you know give a vote of thanks thank you akash and thank you sir uh, it was really a pleasure to listen to you and uh, especially the road map that you drew about how things actually uh, panned out and also the valuable insight that you gave us in terms of how as a policy maker and how the government thinks in terms of how uh, policies and decisions are taken 
uh, a lot of us perhaps have actually been subjected to and have been thinking of whether we have been un under prepared or there was have, there has been lack of planning the kind of points that you rose uh, raised uh, i think gives us all a lot of clarity and uh, i'm hopeful that uh, together we as a as a country and as a community we have the resilience to be able to uh, overcome these adversities so i would really uh, thank you for this insight and i will also leave this thought the bengal is your land sir and we actually look forward to actually having you amongst us uh, in person whenever you are in uh, kolkata next we will be very happy to uh, host you and uh, continue this uh, conversation further so sir uh, please uh, treat this as a very formal invite and we look forward to seeing you whenever you are in kolkata next and uh, in this uh, i would also like to thank uh, all our members who have joined us uh, both on Uh, zoom as well as on social media and of course our thank uh, our we are grateful to our friends in the media who are present and who will hopefully be suitably covering today's proceedings and uh, thank you all once again and i request you all to take this with acclamation thank you sir namaste namaskar